In this video, we take renal failure to the next level. We're going to review some of the stuff, the differential that you found in the third and fourth year clerkship videos, and then go over some pitfalls. We're going to review some laboratory diagnoses that people make and some tests they get, and I'm going to show you why you don't have to, why you can clinically reason your way into the answer without getting a bunch of lab tests. But let's start off with a differential for the things that cause renal failure. We're going to use the same system as before. That is, the heart or the pump that is connected to a series of pipes that has to go against gravity, that is, against resistance, to get to the kidney. Now, a lot of people don't like the kidney. It's very difficult to figure out what's going on, so something magical happens inside the kidney, and out the other end comes some urine, and your readers are attached to a bladder. See this as pre-renal, post-renal, and intra-renal. Let's start with a differential for pre-renal failure first. That is going to be anything that prevents perfusion to the kidney. And so you could see that potentially you could lose the pump. Situations such as congestive heart failure or NMI would lead the pump to break and not enough forward flow to get to the kidney. That would cause decreased perfusion to the kidney. You could have a hole in the tank where just all the fluid coming out. If you didn't have enough volume to fill the pipes, the kidneys wouldn't be perfused. This is a state of being volume down. And that is the four Ds, diarrhea, dehydration, diuresis, and hemorrhage. You could have leaky pipes. They didn't have a hole in them, they're losing a whole bunch of fluid, but it leaks out into the third space. These third space diseases are the oci. In addition to CHF, which can third space fluid, I want you to remember the oci, cirrhosis, nephrosis, and gastrosis. Cirrhosis where you can't build albumin, so you can't hold on to fluid in third spaces. Nephrotic syndrome, where you pee out protein, so you don't have any oncotic pressure. And gastrosis, which is either a protein-losing enteropathy or core protein malnutrition. So you can have leaky pipes, a broken pump, or clogged pipes. Any sort of blockage in the renal artery is going to lead to a decreased flow. And this is going to be renal artery stenosis. Either it's going to be an old man with atherosclerotic disease or a young woman who has fibromuscular dysplasia. Of course, you can add on more to this differential, including cholesterol and emboli that go into the renal vessels and block up the arteries. But I want you to see this when you encounter someone who has an elevation in their creatinine, that is, they have renal failure. If you think it is pre-renal, you need to consider a large number of diagnoses, and you're going to get that based on the history and physical. Are they volume down? Do they, are they third spaced? Do they have CHF or an MI, or do they have risk factors for renal artery stenosis? I also want you to point out that we're going to start at pre-renal. This is where you begin the workup. And because the kidney is difficult to understand, you don't really want to get into that kidney, you're going to also look at the post-renal second and finish with intrarenal if you don't have an answer by then. And I will tell you that pre-renal is all about getting fluid to the kidney. If you don't get enough fluid to the kidney, it's poorly perfused. Post renal causes of renal failure are all about obstruction. That is, you've got fluid to the kidney, the kidney is making urine, but something got in the way. Say a stone. The kidneys are going to continue to make urine until they're dead. If you have 
a blockage in the tubing in the ureter that leaves the kidney. If the kidney keeps making urine and you've got a blockage, more fluid gets into the ureter but can't get out. So what happens to the ureter? It dilates. So hydrourethra and eventually hydronephrosis, hydro, is the symptom of obstruction. What can cause the obstruction depends on what level you're at. Stones and cancer occur at every level. That is in the kidney, in the ureters, in the bladder, and in the urethra. Men can have obstruction of the urethra by BPH. Women can have obstruction of the ureter by having a cystocele. But I want you to understand that it doesn't matter where you are, what the differential is. What you are going to see is hydronephrosis from behind the obstruction. And in order to cause renal failure, you either have to have bilateral obstructions or one common obstruction. Because in order to elevate your creatinine from one to two, you have to lose 50% of your GFR, which means that you can shut down an entire kidney and the highest your creatinine would get is two. So the, kid, the good kidney may be able to compensate over the obstructed one. Hopefully the patient will tell you something like intense abdominal pain from the stretch, but you might not get that. So, pre-renal is about blood flow to the kidney. Post-renal is about obstruction of the urine out of the kidney. Intrarenal disease is about inside the kidney. And people really don't like this because it's fairly complicated. And let me try to make it easier for you as you approach kidney disease. Intrinsic kidney disease can occur in three places. This is the glomerulus, the nephron, You can have a dysfunction of the glomerulus called glomerulonephritis. You can have dysfunction of the tubules themselves called acute tubular necrosis or you can have damage done to the space in between called the interstitium, acute interstitial nephritis. Now going beyond that is not very necessary because what you're going to look at for intrinsic renal disease is going to be a urine. You're going to see a urinalysis with urine electrolytes. What you're going to do is look for casts. Glomerulonephritis will have red blood cell casts. Acute interstitial nephritis will either have eosinophils or white blood cell casts or white blood cells. And acute tubular necrosis will have muddy brown casts. Casts are indicative of damage to the nephron itself. Red blood cells or white blood cells can, be, can occur from anywhere in the GU system. But in order to have casts, you have to be in the kidney because the way these casts get into the rest of the urinary system is by sloughing off and falling into the tubule and then these tubules make a mold as they exit. There are certain patterns you have to recognize. Acute tubular necrosis, for example, will go through a normal phase, a aneuric phase, and then a polyuric phase. You can avoid acute tubular necrosis by giving vigorous hydration for intravenous contrast because the contrast is nephrotoxic and the longer it touches the tubules, the more damage it does. The same is true for myoglobin. So someone in rhabdo requires a lot of fluid to make sure the myoglobin doesn't touch the tubules for very long, it flushes out the kidney, reducing the contrast or the myoglobin contact. The toxin contact is reduced. In acute interstitial nephritis, it is an 
itis. It is an inflammation and is generally going to be caused by infections or drug reactions. And glomerulonephritis has its own lecture because there's so many glomerulonephritides. You're generally going to diagnose them by a biopsy and you only go to biopsy if it's absolutely necessary as we'll talk about. So the reason why I'm going through this so quickly is because the details contained in each of these is really going to be something that renal is going to help you with. You will know enough to get a urinalysis looking for casts, but your interpretation of the urinalysis may not be significant. If you've identified someone as having intrinsic kidney disease, you're not the one to fix it. It's going to be the nephrologist. On the other hand, if you find someone with pre or post renal failure, you can do the entire intervention yourself. All right, so this is how people usually approach this. They find someone who's got an elevated creatinine. And what they do is, first step, rule out prerenal disease. And you do that with a BUN to creatinine ratio and a FENA. If the BUN to creatinine ratio is greater than 20 and the FENA is less than 1%, they say it's prerenal disease. Now, one of the major mistakes people make is they say, well, it's prerenal, so they need volume. Wrong. If it's prerenal, you need to decide what their volume status is. Because if they are volume up, that is, they're overloaded. You do not want to give someone who's volume overloaded more fluid. You want to diurese them. If they are volume down, then you do want to give them volume. And so intravenous fluids is a good idea. But how do you assess someone as being volume up or volume down? And I'll give you two different scenarios. The first is the congestive heart failure patient with volume overload. They're third spaced from their nipples to their ankles. This person clearly has volume overload and will respond well to diuresis. The reason why that is is because in heart failure, with volume overload, the actin and myosin are separated far apart. And as you diurese them, they come closer together and the heart starts beating better. They are intravascularly overloaded. A cirrhotic, on the other hand, will have a large amount of ascites and even some peripheral edema. They'll be up 10 liters, but they'll be intravascularly deplete and they require albumin infusion to fix their renal failure. Both of them are pre-renal. Both of them appear to be volume overloaded, but one condition responds to diuresis and one responds to albumin or fluid resuscitation. What you can't get out of the BUN to creatinine ratio or the FENA is what to do. And so let me show you how the FENA works and why you may not want to use it at all. The FENA is all about the response in the nephron. And we're going to use this diagram a lot during this course. And it has to do with aldosterone. I bought my house in New Orleans after Katrina, and there we have what I call a Katrina switch. It's not one of those light switches that has two different places so that one has to be up and one has to be down for light to be on. In my house I have two separate switches where down is on and up is off. And you have to remember that this is a Katrina switch for this to work. Because what people learned in first year is that the JG apparatus, the macula densa, assesses the amount of sodium going by the system. That confuses people because sodium load and sodium concentration are different. Forget it. Just see it as flow through the system. If there's large flow through the system, it's pushed to off. If it's not, it falls by gravity to on. This system makes renin, which turns on ANG2, which turns on aldosterone. And aldosterone is designed to absorb sodium from the urine, sacrifice K, such that down at the bottom, antidiuretic hormone can absorb water. Because water 
follows salt. A byproduct of aldosterone is the loss of hydrogen ion and reabsorption of bicarb. Let's work through the system briefly. I take you, throw you in the desert, have you walk back three days, no food, no shelter, no water. When you come back, you are going to be volume deplete. The flow through the renal artery will be decreased, the GFR will be decreased, the flow through the system will be decreased. The switch will fall by gravity to on, renin will go up, NG2 will go up, ALDO will go up. Sodium will be reabsorbed and potassium lost, bicarbonate will be retained, and hopefully ADH will be appropriately activated and absorb water. In this case, the urine sodium is going to be low. The whole point of the phena, the fractional excretion of the sodium, is to determine whether or not the kidney is working. The amount of sodium that's cro that crosses the glomerulus will be changed, but if ALDO is working, most of that sodium will be reabsorbed, not lost in the urine. Thus, the fractional excretion of sodium will be low when the kidneys are working. If instead we take that same person and we just annihilate the collecting tubules, we lose all these channels. It doesn't matter if ALDO's on or not. If ALDO can't work on the tubules because the kidney itself intrinsically is damaged, then all the sodium that crosses the GFR is going to simply be lost in the urine. If you don't have aldosterone, you can't reabsorb sodium. If the tubules are damaged, you can't reabsorb sodium. And so if the phena is elevated, it's because the kidneys are broken. And so people like this system. It's very clear. If the phena is low, kidneys are working. If the phena is high, kidneys aren't working. Pre-renal, intrinsic renal. But it turns out it doesn't work that way most of the time. You need to be oliguric for this to work, and you need to not be on any sort of natriuretic, which means no furosemide, no hydrochlorothiazide, and no spironolactone. In addition, you can use the FE urea, which is not dependent on those things, but the fact is that you have to be very oliguric and in a profound state of kidney failure with low urine output for the phena or the FE urea to work. You're going to find yourself ordering urine electrolytes to determine the phena when it's not necessary, that is when the person is not oliguric. And the BUN to creatinine ratio don't really help you. So we come back to our diagram, the one that everyone knows. Phena only useful in very rare instances of oliguria, and BUN to creatinine ratio not that useful. Instead, what you can do is say, well, this person's volume down. I'm just going to give him some fluids and recheck a BMP. Well, this person looks volume overloaded. I'm going to diurese him and recheck a BMP. And if that's what you do based on your clinical reasoning rather than the following of an algorithm, you're going to perform better than if you just get a bunch of studies and try to figure them out that way. Also, people make the mistake of saying, if the phena is low, then give volume. So to avoid all these pitfalls, simply start by assessing, is it prerenal or not, by assessing their volume status. If they're volume neutral, that's difficult, get some studies. But if they're obviously intravascular down, give them some volume and recheck the BMP. If they're obviously volume overloaded, diarrhea them and check a BMP. At the same time, you're not going to be foolish and just assume that it's not obstructive. So of course you're going to at least consider post-renal failure. You're going to get an ultrasound. Because if you see hydro, whether it's hydronephrosis or hydrourea, you have a post-renal obstruction. And you have to relieve that obstruction. And I will tell you that you are going to work from the outside in. 
That is, you have the urethra and a bladder and two ureters. You are going to place a Foley first to see if you can't drain the bladder. If the obstruction is at the level of the urethra, the Foley will remove it. You'll have a post-obstructive void. That is, you'll have a large volume diuresis with some white blood cells upon placement of the Foley. But if you place a Foley and you have hydro and you don't get any fluid out, that means the obstruction is higher. This requires the urologist to come in and place a J-tube or a stent. That's the indication to call urology. You place the Foley, you've diagnosed it as post-renal with an ultrasound, and it didn't get better. Now you need their help and maybe a scan. But let's say it's not pre-renal and didn't respond to your volume or diuresis. The ultrasound did not show any indication of hydro. Now you're left with intrarenal disease. If it's acute, now the urine studies become useful. You're looking for casts, you're looking for white blood cells, you're looking for eosinophils. If you get any of that information, you have your diagnosis. But if it's more chronic, or these tests are negative, what you're going to use instead is the history and physical. That is to say, people who have diabetes with retinopathy and renal failure probably have renal failure from their diabetes. People who have lupus and renal failure probably have kidney disease from their lupus. You don't have to go getting expensive tests or biopsying these patients because you presume the diagnosis based on their history. If the urinalysis agrees, fantastic. Ultimately, you may need a biopsy if you don't have a good explanation. But usually what happens is that you have a pretty good idea of what it is and you support their renal function with either volume, diuresis, or relief of the obstruction and let the kidneys bounce back on their own. To summarize this lecture, I've kind of made this process more ambiguous. And I hope that at the end of this lecture, you are more confused than when you started. If you watch that third and fourth year clerkship video, it's very clear what you do in the order that you do it in. The, the tests are easy to understand and it's a rigid algorithm. In real life, it doesn't work out so well. The sensitivities and specificities of all of the tests that we do, excluding the ultrasound, are pretty low. So you don't know what's going on in the kidney most of the time. You have to make an educated guess based on your history and physical. The point of this lecture is to review the differential diagnosis and some of the key points you might find. And if you find them, great. But if you don't find them, you have to use other strategies like take a guess and see what happens in order to figure out where you're at in terms of the kidney disease. So it's more ambiguous than the algorithm would imply. And it's up to you to use your own clinical reasoning to try to drive at the original cause and try to fix it. And if you've reasoned your way to one particular diagnosis, pick the test that will confirm it and give the treatments that will assist it. That is renal failure. We make these videos for free and we need your help. Please donate because without your donations we can't make any more videos. Please donate!